Well, once again, glad to have you uh, worshiping alongside us. We're in the study of Mark, like I've said. Uh, and if you don't have a Mark journal uh, and you want one, we still have a few chapters in the book of Mark left. And so you can pick a couple of those up in the uh, back tables back there. You can download one on our website. You can kind of get going there. Uh, today, the, the scripture is from Mark chapter 12. So if you want, if you have a Bible, you can start getting there. But it's on page 50. 253 are the a sermon note area for, in your journals there. You can start looking at that. Um, but one of the things, that just before I jump into the message portion, uh, that I want to mention about these journals. Uh, if you have one of these journals, you'll notice that there's some QR codes that are in there that kind of give you links to some cool videos that help you learn and kind of teach a little bit more about uh, what's going on and maybe what you're learning in the book of Mark. Uh, this chapter, there's a, there's a QR code for a video that's a really good one. Uh, and I mean, they're all really good, but this one is one that I was really drawn to. And so I encourage you to, to take some time this week, if you hadn't get a chance this past week, to watch that video, to watch that. It's not a very long video, but it's a good one that kind of gives some shaping there. If you don't have a, a phone that can scan the QR code, you can always go to our website, limeacrossroads.org, and then find the, resor the resources tab on our website, and you can find that, navigate that, and all those videos are there for you so you can study and can click those links and go from there. But we're in Mark chapter 12 this morning. We're continuing in this little study here of ours. And this, we're going to get to this portion of our, of our teaching where we see Jesus affirming the, uh, the road of generosity, the practice of giving to the work of God, giving financially and stewarding our resources in a way that is generous and giving away to the work of God. And the role that generosity plays in our hearts in shaping our life into the ways of Jesus. That we would learn, learn to live our life by faith. Trusting and believing the ways of Jesus lead to eternal life. Now if you know that one of our parts of our mission statement is this aspect of learning to live by faith. And that's kind of broken into three different practices for us. And you see on the side walls there those practices that we engage in. And the painting, the, the drawing of the little hand that's, that's dropping the two copper coins, that is to represent generosity generosity and the painting was came, coming out of this passage that we're studying today Mark chapter 12 verses 41 through 44 and so this passage is a is a central passage of our life as it learns to as we learn to live by faith that we're trusting and believing and it comes to generosity. How do we live generous lives? How do we live lives that are reflecting the servant of Jesus, that are learning to give our life away for the benefit of others? Not just in serving, not just in our time, but also in the resources that God has entrusted to us. That we are to give our, our time and our talents, but also that we are to give our money, our resources, to steward them in the way of God. Now, right before we get into, into the study and read the passage and go from there, I'm just going to acknowledge the elephant in the room that we can think about because when, oftentimes people come to a church and you think, oh, here we go, we're going to start talking about money again, and this is what happens. You go to a church, they talk about money all the time, and for some people, this subject is a reason that they have stopped coming to church for some time. This subject, this idea, this talk about money or about how to handle our finances is, has been handled in a way in a church setting that shame, brings all sorts of shame, all sorts of guilt, all sorts of that kind of stuff. And that's one reason that people have stayed away from the church for a while. For a while. But the truth is, if we're going to study Jesus and if we're going to be his students, if we're going to be his apprentices and learning to live our life the way he would live our life if he were us, we have to pay attention to what he teaches. And Jesus teaches about money more than any other subject other than the kingdom of God, other than what the kingdom of God is like. He teaches about money and about finances, about resources more than any other subject of all, more than love, more than forgiveness more than grace. He teaches about money and how as apprentices to Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we are to approach money and how we are to use it for his kingdom purposes. So if we want to be apprentices to Jesus, if we want to follow Jesus, then we need to learn to follow his teachings on all of our life, not just on the parts that we want to focus on on ourselves. And how we live and how we view and use money will reflect our priorities. Are we prioritizing the things of God, honoring Him above everything, or are we caught up in our own story where we just want to be about what we're about? 
And money and the love of and money and the pursuit of money can grip us in such a way that it really robs us of the joy that God has come to give us. This, this joyful, abundant life, this eternal kind of life that God has come to equip and give us to, when we pursue and when we love money more than anything else, it robs us of this eternal kind of life that we've been invited to live right now. So the question is, how do we use and view the resources that God has given us? Do we learn to use and receive them from a kingdom perspective and to not be mastered by them or the pursuit of them? So the, this morning message, like I said, is Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. If you have a Bible with you, hopefully you have that open already or an app on your phone. If you're online, you can use that little feature that we have right there online, that little tab there, and you can follow along with us. Uh, but uh, before we read the passage, let me pray for us, and then we'll dive right in to see what God teaches us. God, we're grateful that you would call us to faithful living in your kingdom right now. We pray that we would be good students of yours. Learn from you how to live our eternal kind of life right now. Give us grace. Give us patience. Give us the, the fuel that we need to be your students in all areas of our life, including how we view and how we use the resources you've given us. And in your name we pray. Amen. All right, with all those disclaimers and words out there to begin with. So Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, and it reads like this. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Now, as we talk about generosity, as we talk about faithfully giving, I want to draw our attention just to a couple of things here, and then I'm going to hopefully give us some principles about how to honor God with the finances and the resources that God has entrusted to us. The first thing I want us to notice is that generosity or giving faithfully, sacrificially, joyfully is commended by Jesus, is, uh, is affirmed by Jesus. Part of what it means, in other words, to be a follower of Jesus means that we handle our finances differently than the prevailing culture handles it. That we follow Jesus in the way of handling our money or handling our finances, the resources, differently than the prevailing culture. And Jesus affirms this practice of generous and joyously and sacrificially giving to the work of God in the world. Regardless of the amount Regardless of if, whether we have lots of it or we have little of it, how we view our resources and our finances and our money is shaped by our faith. And is Jesus our king or not? Constantly running after more things, constantly trying to find more stuff to buy and to purchase and to run after those things or being mastered by them or, the, or pursuing them at all costs. Well, like I said, it robs us of the joy that God has come to give us. It reflects a perspective of life that the, quote, best life is somehow to be purchased. The best life is somehow to be found when I gain more things or I have more uh, accumulation of wealth or accumulation of, mon- uh, of material goods, that somehow that will give me the best life. But Jesus teaches us something far different, that the, quote, best life will never be found in attaining more things or in having accumulation of more material wealth or material things. But the, the best life that we could ever have is when we pursue a life of faith in Jesus, where our highest priority is to learn to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. That that is our highest priority, and that is where we will find the abundant, eternal, satisfying, joyous life that we've been called and created to live. And when we learn to live this life by faith, when we walk the road of faith, eventually it will lead us to a life of generosity. It will lead us to a life of freely and joyously giving to the work of God in this world for the benefit of others, that others would come to know God that others would come to experience the grace and the goodness of God in their life. 
And until our faith in God works its way into the very details of our life, until our faith works all the way down there, including how we view and handle our resources, then our life with God will remain shallow and just kind of unaffected. Most of our life will just kind of go on autopilot the way our prevailing culture is, and we will miss the deep, eternal kind of life that God has come to invite us to. Jesus affirms generosity as a step of faith. And the second thing, just kind of overarching, I want us to notice is that faithful generosity will grow your faith in the one who is good to provide. Faithful generosity grows our faith, deepens our roots in the one who is faithful to provide and is generous to provide. The one who is trustworthy, who is good, as Samantha was reminding us just a moment ago. Generosity, when we, when we commit to generosity and, and giving to the work of God in this world, it grows our faith and it enables us to actually experience God as provider for us. To not just think about God as providing for us, but to experience God as our provider. Jesus says that this poor widow gave all that she had to live on. She exhibits this deep faith in God to provide for her. And he, sh- and he does. He shows up. The assumption here is that God indeed provides for us when we live all of our life for his benefit, for his kingdom, for his honor. He provides. He shows up in ways that we didn't expect him to show up. And we experience him in deeper, more profound ways when we walk the road of faith. But that is when our faith gets down into the details of our life. Similar to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 where he teaches us to not store up for ourselves treasures on earth but to store up treasures in heaven. That we would experience God as our provider. God as our one who is gracious to us. One who shows up. One who is good and trustworthy. Now just to be real clear, Jesus says this woman gave all that she had to live on. And I don't think that Jesus is giving us a new commandment. I don't think he's given us a new legalistic way to approach our giving or our generosity. I don't think that Jesus is saying, hey, disciples, gather up here because real serious followers of mine are going to have nothing in their bank account. They're going to empty it all out. They're going to pour everything they possibly can, and they're going to be poor as all poor. They're going to have nothing in their savings account. I don't think that's what he's saying. I don't think he's, he's laying out a new legalistic command that we have to just say, oh, I guess the, the poor widow gave everything, so whatever's in our account, we've got to dump it all out into the offering. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is a heart to honor God is wants to be a part of what God is doing and wants that generosity to be a part of all of our life. That we want all of our life to be caught up and consumed with what God is doing, not just a part of it. Not just a little bit of it, but we want all of our life to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength. And this is the kind of faith that this widow demonstrated, that it wasn't just a portion, but it was all of us. So wherever we are with regards to giving, wherever we are with regards to stewarding our resources in a way that honors God, I pray that each one of us would take a step of faithful giving and growing, joyous, sacrificial giving because it deepens your life with God. It allows you to experience the goodness of God to provide for you and deepens your trust and your confidence in him because he's good and he comes through in ways that we never expected him to come through. And it allows us to step in line with what he is doing and there's a blessing that comes from there. So God affirms this act of faith of giving, and it will deepen our life. So how do you do that? What do you do? How do we step in line with that? How do we have a deeper life with God? If those are the things that God affirms and God calls us to, then how do you do that? And so this morning, fairly briefly, I want to provide for you five principles that you see from this widow's story, her example regarding giving, regarding stewardship of our resources, that if you take with us this week and these next few months and these next years, it will enable us to have a deeper experience of God's blessing in the life of eternal kind of living that God has called us to live right now. Now, each of these are kind of, kind of quick little points, and they kind of build one on the other. So if you're a note taker, I encourage you, jot these things down because they are helpful to kind of come back to as we think about our life with God. First principle, and that is that she has a heart for God. 
I want you to notice where she is when she's giving and where it is that she's giving. She's in the temple. She's in the, she's in the place of worship where God's people gathered and she's worshiping with them. So when you have a love for God, when you have a heart for God, then you will prioritize not only your presence, but you'll prioritize your giving to God's people and to the house of God. When you have a heart of worship, it reflects that way. And you can give to many things. There's lots of good organizations. There's lots of good things that are out there. But when you have a heart for God, when you have a generous heart for God, then it is reflected in a giving to the work of God, to the work of God. And again, I don't bring any of this stuff up as any kind of new form of legalism or any kind of form of a new command that you have to do what I'm saying, those kind of things. I'm just observing that this poor widow wanted to be in the house of God and her desire was to bring her tithe and her offering to the work of God because she had a heart for God. And when you have a desire and your heart for God is growing, then you desire to gather with his people and gather in the house of his people. And to invest in the house of his people. Invest in the place where we gather and where we worship on a regular basis. And there are no perfect churches. Just like there was no perfect temple. We looked about that last week. But her desire and her heart drew her to be with God's people. And drew her generosity to be with God's people. And so she gave. Joyfully, sacrificially gave to the work of God as imperfect as the church was, as imperfect as God's people were, her heart for God drove her to give and to be generous to the work of God at the temple where she worshiped regularly. Second principle that you see in this poor widow is that she refused to make excuses in her generosity. She refused to make excuses. There were things going on in the temple that were not good. That were not right. We talked about that last week. Jesus had to correct things that were going on in the temple. But she doesn't allow that to, as, a, as an excuse for her to keep her at arm's distance from, the, from God's people. It wasn't a perfect temple. It wasn't a perfect church. There were things going on that, she didn't, that weren't right, that needed to be corrected. And yet she didn't allow that to be an excuse for her to stay away or just to not be able to participate in the giving to the church or to the temple, to the place that she gathered for worship. There were bad things happening, but notice what Jesus does. Jesus, just a chapter before, had come into the temple, had turned over the tables, had driven people out, had done all that stuff. But notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't tell the people that are coming to worship and are bringing their resources and bringing their tithe to the temple. He doesn't tell them, hey guys, don't bring your money until we get this thing cleaned up. He doesn't say, don't bring your resources, don't worship by bringing your tithes until we get this thing cleaned up. He tells them to come and bring it anyway. She could have had all sorts of excuses along the way. She could have had an excuse that, well, you know, I don't agree with the way the church is happening, so I'm going to withhold my offering. And yet she doesn't allow that to be an excuse. She gives anyway. She could have had the excuse, well, you know, I don't have much to give. I just have these two small, small copper coins. They're only worth a few cents. I don't have much. Lots of other people, they got lots to give. I don't have much. And yet she didn't use that as an excuse to stop her from giving. She could have had the excuse in her mind, well, you know, the temple, the, the church, it'll run just fine without me. I mean, I'm just one person. It, it'll run. It's a big organization. It'll keep going. But she didn't allow that to be an excuse for her to stop being a part of the worship, being a part of what God is calling her to. She had some potentially valid reasons to stop her, but she didn't. And that leads me to the third principle. She didn't allow the excuses because the third thing, she understood that her giving was to the Lord, not to the temple. Ultimately, her giving was an act of worship to the Lord, not to the church or not to the organization. See, when you give to the work of God in this world, your giving is primarily to God. Not to be seen by others, not to make a big show of it, not in order to make things happen the way you want them to happen, not in order to pay the bills so we can have lights and a microphone that works and a streaming service that works really well. But when you give to the act of God or to the work of God in the world, you give as an act of worship. And so your giving is primarily to the Lord, not to the organization, not to the church. And when we do that, we recognize that all things belong to God. And so it's our act of worship to give back to him, to dedicate, to say, all this is yours anyway, God, and I just want to honor you. 
This is what the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 24. He says, The earth is the Lord's, everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He founded it on the seas, established it on the waters. Everything that we have, everything that we see, everything that we experience, all belongs to God. And so when we grow in our faith, we recognize that God is the owner of all things, and we are his stewards. We are called to steward his resources in a way that reflects his values. And part of that is to be generous and to grow and to give. So when we give, we give to the Lord. We don't give only to the building or to the stuff around here. And that leads me to the fourth thing. She wanted to participate in worship. We've already said this already, but when we give, it's an act of worship. It's not not simply to pay bills. It's an act of worship. And so she wanted to participate in worship. Worship is not a spectator sport that you just sit on the sidelines and watch other people worship and kind of glean a little bit from osmosis. Worship is not done, you know, passively. It is an active thing. And we are invited all throughout the scriptures and all throughout history, we are invited to participate in worship. And when we participate and step out of the sidelines and step out of the stands and participate in the worship, then it accelerates our growth in our spiritual life. People have come to church for decades and they've stood on the sidelines and they stood as spectators and they haven't participated in either singing or speaking or praying or giving or anything else. They have just simply stood on the sidelines and watched. And then they would ask, well, how come my life is relatively unchanged. I've gone to church for decades, but my life is relatively unchanged. My life with God, my spiritual life is kind of plateaued, just kind of stifled there for a a while here. I'm not sure what's going on. And I would just simply ask, have you gotten out of the stands and gotten into the game? Have you recognized that, that worship is not a passive thing that you sit on the back seat and just watch happen in front of you, but you are invited to participate in worship. You're invited to sing, even if you don't have a good voice. You participate. You're invited to pray, even if you don't know the words to say. You're invited to participate. You're invited to read and respond to the reading and go there. Even if you're not sure what to do, you're invited to participate. You're invited to stand at times. That's participating. And you're invited to give because that is participating in worship. This poor widow had only two small copper coins worth only a few cents. She doesn't have the excuse to say, well, I don't have anything to give. She wanted to participate. She wasn't about to show up to the temple and let someone else's worship be good enough for her. She wanted to participate in the worship. So when we give, we give as participation. Not to spectating, not watching, not anything else. But we connect with the Spirit of God. And He speaks and He directs and He deepens our life with Him. To not spectate in worship, but to participate. This widow She could have had all sorts of excuses. She could have had all sorts of reasons not to come to that temple. Maybe she should have gone to another place. Maybe it was a different time. But she didn't let any of it. She pushed through all of it. Why? Because she had a heart for God. She desired God more than anything else. She refused to let these excuses stop her from experiencing the richness, the goodness, and the faithfulness, and the provision of God. She gave sacrificially, joyfully, because she was giving to the Lord, and she desired to worship to participate in worship. So when you come to our gatherings, as imperfect as these gatherings are, as imperfect as we all are, when we come, we come to participate, to sing, to share, to pray, to give. Whether our giving is in the offering boxes in the back of the room, whether our giving is online, whether we do it as an automatic thing from our checking account, whatever it is, we give and we participate in worship. As apprentices to Jesus, learning to live our life the way he would live it if, we, if he were us, we come to learn to serve, and to give our life away, and to reflect that in the pursuit and the way we handle our money. Fifth principle I want to share with you quickly, and that is that she gave more than what was commanded. We are told that she put in all that she had. There's an Old Testament reference to the tithe setting apart 10% of our income 
to the Lord, to be set aside, to be sacred, to be given to the Lord. And faithful people all throughout God's history, faithful people from Genesis all the way through and even till, still today, people desire to encounter God and worship him through giving a tenth or a tithe, setting the, that aside and belonging to the Lord. And some will say, well, yeah, Brian, that's great, but that's Old Testament talk. And we live underneath the New Testament. We need Jesus, and it's a new commandment, it's a new covenant. And I agree with you, it is. But Jesus affirms this giving and the setting aside and sacrificial giving, not only with this widow who gives everything, but in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, and he's correcting the teachers, he says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law, you Pharisees, hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, the dill, and the cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Now listen to what he says. You should have practiced the latter, that means the justice, the mercy, the faithfulness, without neglecting the former, without neglecting the tenth or the tithe, without neglecting the giving to the work of God. So there's a biblical precedent, both the Older Testament and the Newer Testament, which is affirmed by Jesus that a good place to start in our generosity is to start at the tithe. To set aside the first 10% of what we have to be dedicated to the Lord. And as we learn and we worship worship God and growing in our faith through giving of our offerings and our tithes, we see that he multiplies what we have left and we are given this promise that God will meet us in our generosity. He meets us there and he multiplies it and he blesses us in ways that we may have never even seen or even thought of before. The Old Testament book of Malachi says it this way. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough for it, not enough room for it to store it. Now again, I'm not talking about a new form of legalism. I'm not talking about a new form of commandment where just you walk in and you just have to do exactly what it is. But when we joyously and willingly, sacrificially give, we are given this promise that God will meet us in our generosity and he will multiply what is left and there will be blessing that comes from that, that we will experience that. How we handle our finances and the resources that are given to us to steward is a reflection of our heart. So we have a heart of worship. Or are we caught up in this prevailing culture's view of money and stuff and pursuing that? Those of us who claim to follow Jesus, those of us who claim to be his apprentices and learning to live our life the way he would live our life if he were us, well, we ought to be growing in faithful generosity to learn to give our life away, including to give and steward our resources away for the work of God in this world. And a good place to start is a look at the tithe and to give to God's people, to give to the house of God that we gather on a regular basis. So wherever you are, at whatever level of giving that you may be at, are you giving with joy? Are you giving out of a heart of worship to reflect a desire for God's kingdom, to steward what is already his, but is entrusted to you to steward for his benefit, for his glory, Are you stewarding that in a way that reflects his heart? Or have you allowed excuses to stop you, to stifle your growth? Have you allowed these excuses to stop you from deep, abiding, joyous life, eternal kind of life that God has invited you to live right now? That work that into the details, even down to how you view and use the resources. Let me close with a personal note. A personal story in my own life. Gina and I, before we were even married, made a commitment to faithfully give a tenth of all that we have to the work of God in, our, in the world. And over the last 23 years of marriage, and yes, I had to do a little math this week to figure out how long that was. Over the last 23 years of our marriage, a non-negotiable part of our life, married life together, has been this tithe this tenth this part of our worship non-negotiable in our life has been to be a part of to be to grow in this aspect of tithing and there have been times when the math didn't really work out when we knew what was left in our savings account what was left in our checking account and we knew that we were had made this commitment to faithfully give 10 percent 
And out of a desire to honor that commitment, out of a desire to honor God with our first fruits, with our first amount, with our first 10%, we wrote the check first, even knowing that we may not be able to make it for the rest of the month. And time after time, we watched in amazement how God did more with the 90% that was left than we thought possible with the 100%. And it was times like that, that's not just once or twice, but multiple times in our life as we made this a non-negotiable in our life where we thought the math didn't work out and we watched with amazement how God showed up and provided and was generous and he multiplied what we thought was impossible, God thought was possible. It was times like that that grew our faith and it brought us joy and, and, and an unending satisfaction in a way that we could not wait for the opportunity to participate in worship again. Where we couldn't wait for an opportunity to honor God and to testify to his goodness and his trustworthiness and his provision that we would be able, be able, the opportunity to give again. We made this a non-negotiable 23 or so years ago in our married life and we haven't looked back since and we've never regretted it. We've never regretted it. Now, I'm sure in a room like this and those that are streaming online, there are stories like that all over. Stories that you can share of a time when you're deep in faith and your confidence grew as you learned to grow and you saw him as a provider and as good, as trustworthy. As you walked the road of faith and it worked its way into the way you used your resources. So my prayer for you, my prayer for me, my prayer for each of us as we look to apprentice ourselves to Jesus, is we would be a people with a heart of the things of God. That we would be people who aren't satisfied with passive worship, but we would be active. And that we would learn to trust the goodness and the provision and the faithfulness of God. And we would participate with him joyously, freely, and sacrificially as we learn to give our lives away, and even our resources away for his work, for his kingdom. And that we would learn to live by faith. And we would find him to be trustworthy and good along the way. Let me pray for us as we go. God, we are grateful that you have shown yourself faithful. That you give us the example of your son Jesus. That we may follow in his way that we will learn to give our lives away, not hoarding or holding on, but sur full surrender, including our finances. And as we do, would you meet us, multiply what is left, multiply our faith, strengthen us in your ways. It's in your name we pray. Amen.